Okay, when Jesus disappoints us. If I may put it this way, and I do it with the utmost respect and, and reverence to God, when you study the Gospels, all four, and you look at the ministry of Jesus Christ here on this earth, and when it comes down to the end of his earthly ministry, now again, I say this out of respect and reverence, but Jesus proved to be almost a disappointment to those who followed him and expected so much out of him. Do you remember the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus? Remember that story? They, uh, let, let me share it with you here and set the example. They're walking along the road to Emmaus shortly after Jesus had been crucified. And as you read that text in, in uh, Luke chapter 24, you see that and you can almost feel and you can almost sense the disappointment that were in those two men. Now knowing that Jesus had risen from, not knowing that Jesus had risen from the dead, and, and they didn't know that it was him who was walking along, they were mourning his death, folks. But their fellow traveler asked them this question. He asked them why they were so sad. And in my mind's eye, I can almost see these two men, and one of them was by the name of Cleopas. And I, I can see these two men look at him, and they were just astonished by his question. It's almost like they couldn't believe that he would ask something like that. And if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 24, and it says this, And one of them named Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem? And aware of the things which happen here in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, The things about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word in the sight of God in all people. And how the chief priest and our, our rulers delivered him to the sentence of death and crucified him. Now here's that verse where it just, it just oozes almost with disappointment. Verse 21. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel Indeed, besides all this, it is the third day since these things happened. But also some women among us amazed us when they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it exactly as the women had also had said. And here comes that another part that is just so drenched with disappointment. But they did not see. Think of the disappointment in that verse when they said, but we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. These disciples, like so many others of that day, they were expecting Jesus to be that conquering, victorious Messiah that the Jewish people were hoping for and had long been expecting. They were looking for him to be a mighty political and military leader, one who would overthrow the Roman government 
and bring a victorious end to their occupation of the land and who would then take his rightful position on the throne of David and restore the earthly kingdom of Israel to its former glory like it was under King David and King Solomon. That's what the people were looking for. Instead, what happens? Jesus, the one upon whom they had pinned their hopes, was crucified on a Roman cross. Like a common criminal. And all their expectations of who this Jesus was, if he's Messiah, was just cut short in their minds. And we find that the Lord rebukes them for their misunderstanding the scripture. Luke 24, look at verse 25. And he said to them, O oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. He's trying to get their attention. Was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? Then I like this. Then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Now folks, these disciples, they were disappointed with Jesus because he did not fulfill their expectations of what they had of him. Remember what they expected of him as Messiah, that military political leader who would kick Rome out and reestablish Israel's kingdom like under King David and King Solomon. And so he rebukes them for not having the right expectation, for not believing what the scriptures, that's why I read those verses there in, Matthew, or in Luke, that they did not believe the scriptures that had been spoken by the prophets about Messiah. And we just read, the Lord begins next to speak from the writings of Moses. He, he goes all the way back and on through the rest of the scriptures. Point by point, he proves to them that in dying on the cross, he actually fulfilled everything that scriptures promised concerning Messiah. That's what he did. And I have to tell you, I would have loved to heard that message, wouldn't you view? For Jesus to be, and you be one of the three then, if you were with Cleopas and the other one, wouldn't there be three of you? But for him to start with Moses and come all the way forward through all the prophets explaining what Messiah had to go through and explaining that he himself just went through it. And it tells me also in Luke's gospel that, that they were affected by that message. Because here's what it says. It says their hearts burned within them as he opened the scriptures to them. I can't help but wonder when was the last time our hearts burned within us when we opened his scriptures and read his scriptures. And at this point, I believe that they begin to see the problem. Okay? And here was the problem. The problem wasn't with him, but with them. They had not believed what scriptures had said concerning him, and so they had come to expect him to do things that he had never promised to do. And naturally, when he didn't do them, what they expected, they were disappointed. Now, let's be honest with ourselves this morning and honest with the Lord. 
I think if we are honest with ourselves and with the Lord, we have all been a little disappointed with Jesus at times through our spiritual lives. Let me ask you this. Did you ever approach the Lord with a set of expectations and find that he did not fulfill them? I've encountered people who became offended at Jesus because he didn't do what they expected him to do. Some folks expected that if they asked that he would get them out of some situation or some problem that they had gotten themselves into, and when he didn't, they became disappointed in him. It's almost like they have this philosophy, they have this, this thinking that once I accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, everything in my life, and this is a deep, deep theological term, everything in my life are to be hunky-dory. Everything in my life are to be smooth sailing. Well, I hate to burst your bubble, but nowhere in the Bible does that say that. Quite frankly, it says just the opposite. Others have expected that if, that if they pray and ask him, Jesus is obligated, it's almost like it's his, he has to, to take away their illness or the illness of some loved one. Listen, we have all prayed for loved ones, and they've gone on to be with the Lord. But let me ask you this, this, did God answer your prayers? You probably prayed, Lord, heal them, restore them. And then they didn't, and they died. But they died in Christ. Were they healed? Were they restored? Yes. But it was His way, not always our way. I've heard these stories and many more in one way or another, and I've been told, listen, Valley, I tried trusting Jesus, and I found that he didn't help me, and it doesn't work to trust him. I don't know. Maybe some of you have heard those stories. Because we had an expectation of who Jesus was and what he was supposed to do, and when he didn't fulfill them, we got offended. We got disappointed. And again, the problem is never with the Lord Jesus when he disappoints our expectation. The problem is always with us because of our expectations of him. We expect him to do something that he never said he would do and we expect him to fulfill our expectations on demand. I want it here, I want it now, I want it this way. Boom, end of story. And when it doesn't happen, well, how dare he? Beloved, you're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. tell you this morning the plain fact God is not obligated to fulfill our expectations that we place on him if they're not biblical but on the other hand I've been I the, the more I've gotten to know the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior over the years the more he surprises me as I've gotten to know him better, I've found that he isn't always what I expected him to be. He's been better. And he does something that he's promised in a way that, that my little mind cannot even think of. See, I want it this way because this is the only way I can think. This is, this is the way you want it because it's the only way you can think. We don't have the mind of God. God says, you watch what I do. 
because it's in my will for you, and I want it for you, and I desire it for you, but I'm going to show you the way that I'm going to do it because it's going to draw you closer to me. And I'm so glad that the Lord has, that he, he, he's seen fit to include this morning's story in our scriptures. At first glance, now, when going back to Matthew, at first glance, it seems like a very bad piece of public relations to have in the Bible. After all, in Matthew's account, the 11th chapter of Matthew, the man who was appointed by God to be the greatest advocate of Jesus in his earthly ministry, the man who in fact had been prophesied in the Old Testament scriptures as the forerunner and proclaimer of the Lord's earthly ministry, expressed a growing sense of disappointment. Now, the Lord takes his doubts and his disappointments seriously, and he answers them. Isn't that what we read in Matthew, verses 1 through 6? And what the Lord told him in these passages gives encouragement, I believe, to you and I. When we sometimes have doubts. And we're going to have doubts because we're humans, folks. Because we're human, we will have doubts. And this morning, I want to share with you three things from our text in the Gospel of Matthew. Number one, I want you to notice the problem. The problem. Jesus does not always fulfill the expectation that we place on him. Go back to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11. Look, look again at verse 1 through 3. When Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to preach and teach in the cities. Now when John, John the baptizer, John the Baptist, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples. And he said to him, Are you the expected one? Or... Shall we look for someone else? The setting of this particular account was the completion of Jesus' commission to his 12 disciples. So he sends them out with orders to preach about him. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 6 says to preach about him to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now throughout chapter 10... Jesus gave them instructions, gave him different, many instructions and different warnings. So in chapter 11, verse 1, he, he finishes giving the instruction and he sends them out. And in Matthew's gospel, Matthew goes on to suggest to us what was happening within the mind of John the Baptist during this time. John had been thrown into prison. Many scholars believe that he had been prison for some time, some say up to a year. Now let's remember John the Baptist. He served faithfully as God's prophet. He had even for, for confronted open sin in the life of King, King Herod. He had confronted Herod Antipas because Herod had married his brother's wife, which was in total disobedience to the scripture. Now try to think with me what might have been going on in John's mind. You're in prison. You have been a faithful prophet of God's. You stood out in the wilderness day in and day out proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, the coming one. Now 
John knew that he had been indeed sent by God as the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. He knew that he, it was given by God for him to announce the coming Messiah, to point Jesus out to the people. And listen what God told, uh, told John to declare. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that's what John did day in and day out. And what's more, he knew that this coming one would be a conquering, victorious Messiah. If you have your Bible still open, and I pray you do, turn over to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, look, look at verse 11. Now this is what, what John is tells the people, okay? Starting in verse 11, he says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. And he will gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's some pretty heavy-duty words, isn't it? But that's what John preached day in and day out. And now, and he was faithful and now John sits in prison and he sees that Jesus was not even behaving like that conquering Messiah. That John and all of Israel expected the Messiah to be. There's the problem, isn't it? We have expectations about the Lord, but he doesn't always fulfill those expectations that we place on him. And it seems to me as I read the Bible more and more that we should get used to the fact that Jesus often surprises us. Right? Because he doesn't always do it like John the Baptist or Peter or James or the other John or somebody else, me, you, expects him to do it. He does it his way. And just when we think we know him, we find that he is quite a bit different from what we thought he was. He always proves to be more than we thought he was, and he will always prove to be greater than our expectation of him ever, ever were. Christ Jesus will always, listen to this, Christ Jesus will always exceed your expectations of who he is. Always. Number two, the fact. Jesus keeps his promise in greater ways than we expected. Look at verses four through five of our text. Then Jesus said to them, to the disciples of John. Go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. I like how the Lord deals with John's doubt, don't you? Now, Jesus loved John, and he expected, or he respected his sincere question. Notice, the Lord doesn't rebuke him, does he? No, not really. But he did give him the answer that John needed. And he gives it to him in verses 4 and 5. And perhaps there's a lesson for you and I in this. 
Sometimes our doubts and our disappointments are made more bearable through the experience of another brother or sister in Christ that Jesus sends to us. John sent the disciples to Jesus saying, Hey, are you the expected one? Or should we look for somebody else? Jesus looks at these guys and he said, Here's what you go tell John. Okay? Here's what you tell him. You tell him what you hear and what you see. And he lists off these things. Perhaps there are times when, when you and I doubt, and we have our doubts, and Jesus takes those away by sending to you a brother or sister in Christ that has gone through some personal experience, and they say to you, hey, I know where you're at. I've been there. I've experienced those same things, or really something similar to that. I had my doubts. I had my disappointments. But let me encourage you by sharing with you what God has done for me. And they share with you. And your encouragement level goes up. They share with you that Jesus truly is the Son of God and that He powerfully changes the lives of those who trust Him. Now, He may not fulfill our own false expectations of Him, but if we listen to others and we listen to His Scripture and those others that love Him, we may well be reminded that He does so much more than what we expect. And Jesus, in our text, he goes on to pass on to, to John through those disciples his messianic credentials to John. Those things that he lists there in verse 5, these are, of course, are all things that Jesus had done throughout his earthly ministry, hadn't he? Yeah. But there's more. The report of these things would have been important to any Jewish man or Jewish woman who knew the Old Testament promises about Messiah. Every Jewish person who was truly paying attention, who knew the scriptures, who knew the Old Testament, would have remembered such passages, and I'm going to give you these passages, and hopefully you'll write them down. Isaiah 29, verses 17 and 18. Isaiah 29, verse 17 and 18, it's promises of the glorious day of the coming of Messiah. Or maybe they will remember the words of Isaiah 61, where Jesus himself prophetically speaks words that Jesus carefully attributed to himself during his earthly ministry. Now hold your finger in Matthew's account and go back to Luke. But this time, Luke chapter 4. You remember early in Jesus' ministry, Jesus is in Galilee. He's in the synagogue at Sabbath. And he's given the scriptures, the Old Testament. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release of, to the captives, the recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord.
what Jesus read in that scripture was about himself. And any Jewish man or woman who knew scripture would have known those Old Testament prophet sayings and writings about Messiah. Especially somebody like John. Now, I have to say this. We're not told this, of course, so I'm only guessing. But now, look. Put yourself there. John is in prison. Probably a dungeon. According to, like I said earlier, according to some scholars, he's been in there for at least a year. And he's confronted Herod Antipas about his sin. But I can suspect that John starts reflecting because they, those disciples of him goes back and he says, hey, here's what Jesus said. Here's what's happening. And he names them off in verses 4 and 5. And John starts reflecting on what was told him about the works of Jesus. And I believe that John began to realize that this was the conquering Messiah, but he was much more than what even John had expected. He wasn't just a military or political Messiah. He was spiritual. But I think it also dawned on John that Jesus must first come to serve as a suffering sacrifice. The suffering servant for sinners. And that way, he truly would be the Lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. I believe our doubts and our disappointments with Jesus begin to disappear when we, when we realize he is much greater than what we expected. He fulfills all his promises, but always does so in a way that, that are greater than you and I could possibly imagine. Okay? Okay? He fulfills them. Some of you may remember some years ago there was a movement within the men's world. It was called the Promise Keepers. Many of you, some of you guys went to the conferences. I know I did. And it was a great time of learning to be a man of God and how to walk with God as a man. And to be a godly husband, a godly father, a godly grandfather. Just a godly man in general. And they called it promise keepers because they try to get men to keep the promises of being a godly man. Well, beloved, let me share with you this morning. Jesus Christ has always kept his promises. He's the original promise keeper. The original And every promise that is in the Word of God, listen, let me share this with you this morning. Listen to this. Every single solitary promise that is in this book called the Holy Bible, from Genesis all the way to the book of the Revelation, will be one day fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Every one of them. Don't ever doubt it. Don't let anybody fool you. Don't let any circumstances in your life draw that away from you. Put that in your heart. Jesus will fulfill every single promise he ever made. Now number three, I want to call this the encouragement. The encouragement. Go back to Matthew. Chapter 11. Verse 6. 
Here's the encouragement. And blessed is he who does not take offense at me. To John the Baptist and to all who have mistaken expectations of Jesus that he does not fulfill what he says and blessed is he who does not take offense at me. That phrase in the Greek means to be caused to stumble or be offended. When Jesus disappoints someone's false expectation of Christ, it's easy for them to turn away from him. But it's easy for them, them to think that he has let them down. And so they, don't, they, they want nothing more to do with him. But Jesus says, don't become offensive. Don't let that be a stumbling block. That false expectation you had of me, that you put on me, that is not within the scriptures, don't let that fool you. Don't let that bring you down. Don't call that, cause that to stum, cause you to stumble. Now let's close with this. Now that is not a cue for you to shut your Bibles or put up your ink pen or put up your notepad. All right? Doesn't mean that. It means I'm just drawing it into a conclusion. I'm drawing it into here's an application time. All right? And I didn't have it put in the, in the outline specifically because I want you to write it down. All right? Oh, it's not in the outline. You've got your pen. Write it in yourself. It'll mean more to you. I want to ask you this morning. Did you come here this morning? Or maybe you're listening to this message later on in some way disappointed with Jesus. Or maybe you've been disappointed in the past. And do you do struggle with doubts about Jesus because he hasn't done what you wanted him to do? I'm going to give you several counseling points. All right? And this is what I want you to write down. Number one, step back and examine your expectations of Jesus. I'll repeat it. Number one, step back and examine your expectations of Jesus. Have you... Now... I, I, I want you to write that down, but let me ask you this. Have you been expecting him to do something for you or to be something to you that he's never promised? You'll notice that when you step back and you examine your expectations of him. Apply them to the scripture. Well, Jesus never said he would do that in his scripture. Then how can you expect him to do it? He never promised it. How can you expect him to be the genie in the bottle? You can't. Those false expectations come from our wrong, non-biblical expectations of him. They're not based on scripture. Number two. And I'll repeat myself. I would urge you to go to the scriptures and get to know Jesus better. I would urge you to go to the scriptures and get to know Jesus better. Through the scriptures, find out what he is really like. Learn what he has truthfully, honestly promised to do. As I've been saying throughout this message, he is always greater than your or my 
expectation of who he is. And his word will assure you, ensure me that he will always fulfill his promises. Number three. Remember his words of encouragement. Remember his words of encouragement. And then just right underneath that, remember his words of encouragement. Put Matthew 11, verse 6. Don't let the circumstances or the problems that you're going through cause you to be a stumbling block of having faith in Jesus Christ. Keep going on. Amen? I said I wasn't going to say that this morning. I told myself that. I said, I'm not going to say that. And I just said it. But keep going on. Don't give up. Hold on to him and never let go. Whatever you're going through in life, listen, listen to me, please, brother or sister in Christ, believe me, hold on to him, keep moving, keep going with him, don't give up, never let go, and he will never, ever disappoint you but have the right knowledge of who he is. And admit that you and I don't always understand him, but, but that by faith we will cling to him. How many of you have ever prayed that? I have. Lord, I don't understand what I'm going through. I don't understand what's happening. Have you ever been there? I don't, I can't fathom this, God. But, by my faith in who you are, I'm going to stay obedient to you. I'm going to keep holding on to you. I'm going to keep praying to you. I'm going to keep reading my Bible. I'm going to keep walking with you and I don't know all the ins and outs you do but father you have your will and I'll just take that by faith if you embrace him if you hold on to him if you don't give up if you keep going with all your heart to the suffering Savior who died on the cross for you, then, beloved, you can rest assured that he will never prove to be a disappointment to you. Now, my question this morning is, has God spoken to you? Maybe you have doubts in your life. Maybe you have disappointments. Maybe you have false expectations of this Jesus. Because you remember John's words? Are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Jesus is Messiah. Maj Jesus is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And he will lead you, he will direct you, he will guide you, but don't lay false expectations on him that are unreal. Go to his word, see who he is, and trust in that. Let's pray. Father, today we come before you. And Father, I just pray that you speak to our hearts. I pray, Father, first of all, that if we have false expectations,
sins of who you are, that we will confess those and get those out of our lives. Father God, if we have doubts, help us to read your word and to study your word and get the true understanding of who you are and rely upon that and trust in that. And knowing full well that you will answer our prayers, but maybe not in the false way that we want them or the way that we're hoping you will answer them. But because you are who you are, you may have a different will for our lives and for those of us, for, of our loved ones. Now that doesn't mean that we don't keep praying for them or praying for ourselves. But Father, I pray that you speak to our hearts and you lead us and you guide us. <clears throat> In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's stand together. And take your hymnal and turn to page 312 where you have a beautiful song, Softly and Tenderly. The last couple of weeks, I've said this to you. And so many times on these songs of invitation, remember a couple of weeks ago we sung, We'll Follow Him. Okay, I'll follow Jesus. This time we're singing Softly and Tenderly. So many times when we do these songs, we think about the unsaved being saved. Jesus is softly and tenderly calling for you to be saved and you to make him your Lord and your Savior. Sometimes, beloved, Jesus is calling you and me, softly and tenderly calling you and I as his believers to follow him closely and to reassure us that he will be in our lives and he's in the midst of our lives and he'll not leave us he'll not forsake us we just need to hold on to him <clears throat>